Hello, and welcome to the CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. I'm Joseph Tartle, Acting Deputy Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at CDRH, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Thank you for joining us. The CDRH Industry Basics Workshop brings you the fundamentals on some key areas of FDA's medical device regulations. It's important for you to understand these basic principles in order to successfully navigate the FDA regulatory landscape. This objective addresses the core vision of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education to provide you with the accurate, timely, and useful educational information about medical devices. In addition to the workshop you're viewing today, we've developed a wealth of other educational resources designed specifically for you. Please take advantage of them. One of the resources is CDRH Learn. CDRH Learn is a multimedia catalog of online educational modules, presentations, and audio webinars that cover a wide range of medical device regulatory topics. If you have a question about specific medical device regulation or policy, this is a great place to check out. Another industry education resource we've designed for you is Device Advice. Device Advice provides comprehensive regulatory assistance about medical devices with hundreds of web pages of information at your fingertips. The format for today's program will be as follows. We'll start with a presentation by a speaker from CDRH. At the end of the presentation, the speaker will be joined by a panel of experts, also from CDRH, and we'll have an interactive question and answer session with you. We'll also be able to take your calls during this time. After the session has ended, we'll continue with the next topic. We'll cover two topics during today's program, which continues our education on the topic of Unique Device Identification, or UDI. We encourage you to review our other UDI workshop, which can be found on our CDRH Learn website. Today's workshop will address how to submit information to the Global Unique Device Identification Database, or Good ID. If you're not familiar with Good ID, this program has been designed with you in mind. You'll learn how to accurately enter information into the database so your submission will be successful in order to comply with the UDI requirements. We'll follow a schedule so you can join in for the topics that are of interest to you. We'll begin with our first topic, Good ID Device Identifier Record. At 2.15 p.m., we'll transition to our second topic of the day, HL7 SPL Submission Option. Thank you again for joining us today, and now let's get started. Hello, my name is Indira Kondori, and I am the Program Manager for the Global Unique Device Identification Database, the GUDID. Today's presentation will focus on the GUDID DI record. In today's presentation, I will start with an overview of the GUDID, which we call the Good ID for short. Next, we'll delve into the device identifier record, the DI record, so you understand what the DI record is and learn about the data elements in a DI record. Then I will talk about how to manage your DI record through the life of your device so your information stays updated. And I'll also cover best practices for better Good ID data. Let's review some basics. UDI, the Unique Device Identifier, is composed of two parts. The Device Identifier, or DI, highlighted in yellow on the slide, and the Production Identifier, or PI, shown in green on the slide. The Device Identifier is the fixed portion of the UDI and identifies a given version or model of a device and the labeler of that device. The production identifier is the variable portion of the UDI. It identifies the lot or batch number, serial number, expiration date, manufacturing date, and for human cellular and tissue-based products regulated as devices, the distinct identification code when included in the UDI. The good ID is the repository of key device identification information. Good ID only contains the DI. 
we do not collect the actual PIs, such as the lot or batch number in good ID. What we do collect are PI flags, which are yes or no answers that indicate which PIs are in the UDI. Now here is a high level view of good ID. On the right hand side is access good ID. Data that labelers submit to Good ID is made available to patients, healthcare providers, and any member of the public through Access Good ID. The top blue box shows the two ways labelers can submit information to Good ID the Good ID HL7 SPL submission option and the Good ID web interface option. The Good ID HL7 SPL submission option allows labelers to send their information as XML files via the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway. You will hear more about this in the session following this. The Good ID Web Interface Submission option is a secure web application. Labelers can enter device information one record at a time using manual data entry. The web interface is suitable for labelers with small volume of submissions. Let's move to the Good ID DI record and the data elements. Again, the DI is the fixed part of the UDI. It identifies a given version or model of a device and the labeler of that device. A DI record in Good ID is the device identifier plus the Good ID data element values. Here, you see a physical label of a fictitious device. Most of the values for the DI record data elements come directly from the device label. For example, on the top left you see brand name, in the middle you see the UDI which has the DI and the PI, further down you can find storage and handling, a single use designation, and the labeler name and address. Now, getting into the Good ID DI record itself, remember there are two ways labelers can submit DI record information, web interface and the HL7 SPL. Now, if you are using the web interface, the labeler data entry user will be entering the records. Those using the HL7 SPL submission option will submit them as XML files. Over the next few slides, I am going to walk through the Good ID data elements. The screenshots will be from the Good ID web interface application, but the information about these data elements applies to both submission options. To start out, we have three groups of Good ID data elements device information, device status, and device characteristics. Let us take a look at each grouping. Device information. These data elements cover basic device identification information. From the top and moving left to right, issuing agency. Choose from one of the FDA accredited issuing agencies. For this DI record, it is HIBIC or HIBCC. Primary DI number. This is the DI on the base package, the lowest level of a medical device package containing a full UDI. Device count is the number of medical devices in the base package. Unit of use DI is an unmarked DI and is applicable when the device count is greater than one. I'm going to skip label or dunce number, company name, and address for now. We'll come back to it shortly. Brand name, version or model, catalog number, and device description should be self-explanatory. Let us skip DI record publish date also. We will come back to it later. On to commercial distribution end date. This is the date after which the device is no longer offered for sale by the labeler on record. Commercial distribution status is automatically updated by the system. When an end date has been entered, the status will change to show no longer in commercial distribution after that date. Let's now talk about labeler dunce number. In Good ID, the DUNCE number is used to pull company name and address from the DUNCE database. It's important to make sure that company name associated to the label or DUNCE number matches the company name on the physical label of the device. On this fictitious label, the company name and address are circled in red. The DI record in Good ID should reflect the same company name as the one on the label. The company address in Good ID should also match what's on the label if possible. 
We know that some of you use the DUNCE Doing Business As or the DBA name. You may use the DBA name associated to your label or DUNCE in Good ID if that is what's shown on the label of your device. Here is how the company name and address associated to your label or DUNCE looks in a Good ID DI record. Now here is why this is important. Access Good ID is the portal where we make Good ID information publicly available. If someone has a device label in hand and searches for the device record using the company name on the label, the record that's retrieved should show the same company name as the one on the label. Let's go back to the data elements and continue on with the device information group of elements. Next come alternative and additional identifiers for a device. Direct Mark DI is a DI that is marked directly on the device itself. You only need to provide this in Good ID if the Direct Mark DI is different from the primary DI. If your device has a DI issued by an issuing agency that is different from the primary DI issuing agency, you would enter it under secondary DI. Package DI. These are DIs assigned to higher level packages. More on packages in just a minute. So as you see, all the device identifiers for a given version or model are part of the same DI record. Customer contact information is in the bottom phone and email information that customers can use to contact you if they need more information on a device. Now let's talk a little more about packages. A device package contains a fixed quantity of a particular version or model of a device. Each level of package requires a different DI. On the left hand side of the slide, we have a catheter in a base package with DI 1001. Going across the top, 30 catheters with DI-1001 are put into a box. The box is the second level of package. It is assigned a package DI of 2001. Moving right from package 2001, 12 boxes with package DI-2001 are put into a larger box. The larger box is the next level of package with package DI-3001. At the bottom is another package level in this case, 50 catheters with DI-1001 are put into a box and gets a package DI of 2002. Now here is how this package configuration would be entered in Good ID. On the top, you see that base package DI-1001 is the primary DI. In the bottom, you see the higher level packages are all entered as part of the same DI record. So from our example, package DI 2001, 2002, and 3001 are all part of the same DI record. Now let's move to the second grouping of data elements, and that is device status. This group of elements primarily capture regulatory type of information. On the top, you see checkboxes to indicate if the device is human, cellular, or tissue-based product, a kit, or a combination product. Next, you provide us pre-market submission, FDA product code, and FDA listing number. The GMDN code is circled in red. GMDN stands for Global Medical Device Nomenclature. GMDN is an international nomenclature used to group devices into broad, high-level categories. It consists of GMDN code, preferred term name, and preferred term definition. GMDN codes are created and maintained by the GMDN agency. You need to be a member of the GMDN agency to obtain GMDN codes. The FDA has developed FDA preferred term codes to allow companies to select a GMDN preferred term, but it is preferable for companies to obtain a code from the GMDN agency. The FDA preferred term codes are available when labelers log in to Good ID. If your device requires a new GMDN code, it may take some time to obtain one. So please make sure you allocate enough time to identify and obtain GMDN codes for your devices. Now to the third grouping of data elements, device characteristics. Going clockwise from top right, you see for single use, latex, 
MRI information, and prescription status. Finally, you see the PI flags mentioned earlier. The PI or production identifier may contain the lotter batch, serial number, expiration, manufacturing date, and donation identification number. In good ID, the actual lot or batch or the serial number isn't captured. Instead, you enter yes or no to indicate which PIs are in the UDI. And finally, you see size, storage and handling, and sterility information. That completes the data elements in a DI record. While I have shown you screenshots from the Good ID web application, remember that these data elements are applicable to both submission options, the Good ID web interface, where you manually type in your device record, and the Good ID HL7 SVL submission option, where information is sent as XML files. Now that we have covered what a DI record is, let's understand how to manage your DI record. The Good ID DI record lifecycle helps you manage the entry and edits of information in your DI record throughout the life of the device. There are three DI record states in Good ID: draft, unpublished, and published. Starting with the draft DI record state, a draft DI record is simply that, a draft. If you are a Good ID web interface user, creating draft DI records is a way to test or learn about Good ID and DI records. The draft DI is entered and saved into the system. It is not submitted to the system. Stay with me. I'll explain what submitted means in just a minute. You may edit a draft DI record as much as you like. Draft DI records with no activity will be deleted from Good ID after 180 days. Once you enter a Good ID draft DI record, you can click the review button as shown circled in red to your right. And you can see if your DI record passes all the Good ID business rules. If the record does not pass business rules, you cannot submit. So what do I mean by that? Now here you see when you click review, the system says there are errors. You cannot submit a record with errors. There is no submit button for you to click. You can now resave the record as a draft or fix the error and click review again to see if you passed this time or you may cancel. Let's say I have fixed the error and clicked review. Now the DI record passed because a record was entered correctly. So submit is available as one of the blue buttons on the right side. At this point, you can resave as a draft, submit the record, re-edit the record, or cancel and exit. Once your record is submitted, it is no longer in the draft state. You now have submitted the record by passing all the business rules. After the record leaves the draft state, the DI record publish date determines whether the record is in the unpublished or the published state. DI record publish date is a critical concept. The publish date determines when a DI record is saved in the published state. The system requires the published date to be today or in the future. Your good ID submission requirements are met the date the DI record is saved in the published state. Let's use this picture to depict the relationship between the three record states. Starting from the top, you start with the draft DI record. Walking down the left arrow, you click the review button and pass all the business rules. The published date is in the future, so the record will be in the unpublished state. Walking down the right arrow, you click the review button and pass all the business rules. The published date is today, so the record is in the published state. So let's get into the unpublished DI record a little more. As you just saw, an unpublished DI record is a DI record that has passed a review, meaning it has passed all the business rules, and has been submitted to Good ID by clicking the submit button and has a future published date. Unpublished records can be edited an unlimited number of times. 
These records are not released to Access Good ID because they are not published yet. Now here is a key feature. Any record that has passed business rules can be copied. That means an unpublished DI record can be copied to create new DI records. This can help reduce data entry burden if you are using the manual data entry option because if you copy records that are very similar, the only changes you need to make would be to update information that would be specific to a given version or model. For example, the primary DI of the record would have to change for a different version or model. Let's take a look at the unpublished DI record. On the top right hand side, you see the buttons for copy, edit, and cancel. At the bottom, you see the DI record published date set to a future date. Let's talk about what happens when a record goes from unpublished to published, in other words, moving across the bottom of the slide. Unpublished records have a future published date. Every day after midnight, the Good ID system checks to see if there are unpublished DI records with published date equal today. If there are, then the system changes the record to published status automatically. So if you have a record with published date tomorrow, then tonight after midnight, the automated check would change the status of your record from unpublished to published. Now let us understand the published DI record state. A DI record that has passed review, meaning it has passed all the business rules and has been submitted to Good ID by clicking the Submit button and has a published date of today or in the past is a published DI record. Editing is limited on published records. These records are released to the public on Access Good ID. The records on Access Good ID must be accurate and dependable so they can't be changing constantly. This is one of the reasons for limited editing. Since a published record has passed business rules, it may be copied to create new DI records. And to emphasize from earlier, your Good ID submission requirements are met the date the DI record is saved in the published state. Here is how a published DI record appears in the database. At the top right, you see the buttons for copy and edit. At the bottom left, you see the DI record published date set to a date in the past. These next two slides provide high-level summaries of the DI record lifecycle and the points we have covered for the draft, unpublished, and published states. The DI record state determines the applicable business rule. This slide can be used as a quick reference tool. This second summary slide is for those of you who like flowcharts. You can use it to follow the path of your DI record through its life cycle. You can also find this flowchart in the Good ID guidance document. Please take a look at your leisure. I have talked about how draft and unpublished records have unlimited editing, but some edits are restricted for published records. Let's look at editing published DI records a little closely. I want to introduce another concept to you, the new DI trigger data element. If you change a good ID data element that is designated as a new DI trigger, you won't be able to simply edit a published DI record to change that element once edit restrictions go into effect. Instead, you will need to assign a new DI to your device and submit a new DI record to Good ID. Here is a page from the Good ID Data Elements Reference Table. The table lists all the Good ID Data Elements along with other features for each element. The last column indicates whether a data element is a new DI trigger. The top data element is for single use. It's a new DI trigger. So the column says yes. That's because a device that's intended for single use is not the same as a device that can be used multiple times. Since it is no longer the same device, if you have to change this data element and your DI record is in the published state and has edit restrictions, you need to assign a new DI and enter a new DI record in Good ID. 
Similarly, device package as sterile is a new DI trigger. If the device was originally packaged and used as sterile, but it is then provided non-sterile, it's not the same device and cannot be identified by the original DI. To change this data element value, once your device record is in the published state and has edit restrictions, you would need to provide a new DI and a new good ID DI record. So what if you make a mistake on one of the new DI trigger data elements and did not catch it until after the record is published? The grace period exists for just this type of a situation. The grace period is currently 30 calendar days. If you have a record with published date of January 15, 2016, the grace period starts the day after, which would be January 16, 2016, and ends 30 days later on February 15, 2016. During the grace period, the only data element you cannot edit is the DI record publish date. Other than that, unlimited editing still applies to your records. So if you did make an error, even on a data element that is a new DI trigger, you may edit that record. After the end of the 30-day grace period, the record is released to access Good ID for any member of the public to see and use. Other data elements also have certain limits on editing. So the bottom line is, please use the grace period Take the time to review your records, make any edits or corrections before the record is available for public view. And that leads us to Good ID data quality. Good ID serves as a master repository for device identification information. We think of it as the gold standard for device identification. So please start with good data. Bake in data quality into all your processes as you prepare for good ID. Do everything you can to ensure that your records are accurate when they are submitted and be sure to make full use of the grace period. Good ID has an export feature that can be used to export all the DI records you have entered into good ID. This is a great tool to use to review and validate against your source system data. If you find problems, be sure to correct those records as necessary during the grace period. Finally, please don't wait to review your information until after your records are publicly available on Access Good ID, because by then the grace period has passed and your records would have limited editing. This slide provides you best practices for better data. Device identifier, Ensure your DI is built correctly and validate the DI check digits. Version or model. Please do not include the word version or model in your entry. If you have version 2, just put 2 in the field. If no version or model number is available, you may enter catalog number. Device description. Please do not leave this field blank. We recommend you base your description on the approved or cleared indications for use. Clinically relevant size. Use this field to enter device size. Please do not put size in device description or brand name, and please use the list of values when they apply to the size of your device. If you need a new size value, send us a request through the UDI help desk. GMDN code. One code is sufficient for most medical devices. Remember, it is a way to categorize devices into broad groupings. It is not very granular. Donation identification number is only applicable to devices that use the ICC BBA issuing agency. Here are the steps that we think will lead to successful Good ID submissions. Start with the many resources on our website. They provide great detail on many of the concepts we have touched on today. So take the time to review and please use them. Select your issuing agency and label your devices with UDI. Determine the primary Good ID submission option, the web interface or HL7 SPL. Gather your data and bake in data quality from the beginning. Understand the Good ID account structure. Identify and obtain your DUNCE numbers. 
get a good ID account, and submit your DI records. And finally, subscribe to get notified about Good ID system status. So how do you do that? We make every effort to notify users in advance when we have planned Good ID system downtimes for enhancements and maintenance. So be sure to subscribe to get Good ID system status email alerts by visiting our website. The email alert is also used to notify users of any system-related update, such as document updates. Scheduled downtimes will also be posted on our website at www.fda.gov UDI. Look for Good ID System Status webpage. If you notice that the system is down during a time it wasn't scheduled, first check the Good ID System Status on our webpage. If there is no information, we ask that you please report the issue via the help desk. So, it is time to get started. You now have the basics. If you need more information, please visit our website and take advantage of the resources we have available. Do not forget to bake in data quality from the beginning. Make sure your source system data is correct. Understand the Good ID DI record edit rules so you are effective in managing your records throughout the life of the device. Use the grace period to please review information and make any edits. Subscribe to the Good ID system status notification so you can be alerted of system downtimes and any system updates as we communicate them to our users. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for viewing the presentation on the Good ID device identifier record. I hope you found the information helpful. And now we're going to take your questions. You can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble on the top left corner of your screen. If you'd like to ask your question live, you can also call the phone number you see on the screen now. Our next session, titled HL7 SPL Submission Option, We'll begin promptly at 2.15 p.m., so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can before then. Here to help answer your questions is Indira Kondori, who just gave the presentation on the Good ID device identifier record. We're also joined by Banaz Manai, Good ID data quality lead, and Heather Valadez, Access Good ID lead, both of whom are members of the UDI team for CDRH's Office of Surveillance and Biometrics. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions you've already submitted. So we already have our first question, and it goes back to some discussion that was in the presentation. What do you mean by baking in data quality? This is a great question. Um, as Indira mentioned in her presentation, um, the data quality is uh, um, uh, a subject that should be uh, implemented throughout your processes and uh, have data quality in mind in every stage of your, um, your processes. Uh, make sure you have a process at the end of your data submission to download your data and review it. Um, have you, uh, pro have you uh, followed the instructions and data definitions that we have available in the Good ID data element reference table. Um, does your data match your source data and the label of the device? Do you have faith in the data if the patient or provider would use this data? Uh, additionally, we have uh, two great design components in our uh, database that, again, Indira went over, the publish date and the grace period. Uh, use those two designs uh, in, in your, in, uh, in your uh, review process. Uh, by the published date, your data should be reviewed and checked. Everything should be um, passing all the uh, co data quality checks. Uh, and then you have a 30 days grace period. During this time, you have an extra 30 days to make sure your data is correct before it goes again to public view and uh, can be accessed through our uh, public website. 
I like to say a little bit more about Access Good ID, actually. Um, when you submit your data to Good ID, it doesn't go into a black hole. Actually, it goes into a very public forum. And this is our website, Access Good ID, uh, that we've developed in partnership with the National Library of Medicine. Um, this is the way that the public can view the records that have been submitted to Good ID. So while Good ID is the password controlled, um, access controlled version of the database, um, after, as Benaz mentioned, the, the records complete their, their published date, their 30-day grace period, they're sent to access Good ID. And this is the public forum where all the public information in a record is viewable. And I wanted to say that access Good ID is not meant to be used as a data quality tool. So sometimes people wait until their records appear on access Good ID. Somebody calls them up and says, hey, I noticed an error in your records. And we just want to say, by the time that's happened, it's already too late, because by the time you've seen it, everybody else has already seen it. So really take advantage of the time prior to the published date. You have that 30-day grace period. Um, really, at every stage in your process, make sure that you're ensuring the accuracy of your data before it gets to access Good ID. Think about the end users of access Good ID who want accurate information. They want to learn more about your devices, your products. So provide the, the helpful information that you can with the end user in mind. Thank you, Heather. And we have another question. If we make a product specifically for a distributor and the label indicates manufactured for or distributed by with their address, how is the device identifier submitted? Meaning, does the distributor have to create the device identifier, or can we create a device identifier and submit it with our own DUNS number? Right. So the important thing here is to determine who the labeler is. And a labeler is whoever is commercially distributing the product with their own brand name. Mm -hmm. So if you are manufacturing the device and you are putting the label for what you're referring to here as the distributor on the label of the device, and you, the, then the distributor would then commercially distribute that product under their brand name. In that case, they are the labeler, the distributor, in your, as you refer to, would be the labeler. Now, the distributor would then have to assign a device identifier to that device, and then they would be responsible for submitting the information to GoodID. Okay. Next question. I made a labeler account. How can I get access to the Good ID database so I can enter the device record information? This is a great question. I'm glad that this question came up because we get asked this all the time. There's a lot of confusion about this. So when you first create a Good ID account, you um, designate one or more coordinators. And these coordinators are user account coordinators. They have the ability to create one or more labeler data entry accounts. So these labeler data entry users are the ones who actually enter and edit Good ID records. A coordinator can assign themselves a labeler data entry account, and I mean, if you want to be a one-person show, you can. Yes. You can make yourself a coordinator and a labeler data entry user, and you're off and running. Um, but if you, if we get this question a lot through the help desk, if you're logged in as a coordinator, you won't see the ability to edit your records. So what you need to do is log back out and log in as a label da labeler data entry user, and that's how you'll be able to to actually work with the records themselves. Okay. Coordinators can view the records that have been submitted by the labeler data entry users that they've created. Thanks for clarifying. In the Good ID database, we're required to enter the 510K number of the device. What do we enter for a 510K exempt or a pre-amendment device? So there are certain many class ones and devices that were prior to 1976 that are pre-amendment devices. So what do they do when they need to fill out that field with regards to 510K? That's a good question too. Um, we do have in our database a, an option to um, uh, select uh, which uh, specifies this is a 510K exempt device. Uh, if they check that box or use that field to indicate that they're part of the group that are part of the pre-amendment and uh, don't have a 510K, they don't have to submit a 510K. Okay, so the system will handle that. Correct. Okay, good. If an item is reusable and does not require direct marking until 2018, then do we add the device identifier details to the good ID for this device by the September 20? 16 compliance date as reference only. So what do you do? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, again, uh, we uh, recommend that uh, they have to follow their compliance date for the 2016 and submit their data for uh, the device. Uh, but if they don't have the direct mark DI uh, ready yet, they mm -hmm. can come back and add that uh, information 
at a later time and certainly before the 2018 compliance, compliance date, date. Yeah. right. Yeah, that's good. Is the DI record submitted only one time or multiple times with a product identifier flag? I can take that. So okay. yes, a DI record, remember, is for a given version or a model of a device and the labeler of the device, it would be just one DI record. And in the presentation, I went over that the DI record um, may contain things like package DI, other device identifiers, if they are all identifying that same version or a model, would just be one DI record. Now within that DI record, you would then indicate the production identifiers that you have on the label of the device. It's a yes or a no question. Mm -hmm. um, so you would just indicate that. You would not enter multiple DI records for the same version or model of a device. It is only one DI record for a given version or a model of a device and the labeler of that device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to clarify. In Good ID, sure. um, we we track devices at the version or model level. Um, we don't include production identifiers. Right. We ask only whether the production identifiers are listed on the label. These are things like lot number, manufacturing date, expiration yes. date. Um, we don't actually know, you know, for example, the whereabouts of all five hundred thousand of a particular device. We're not tracking at that level. We only okay. track a version or model of a device. Okay. Thanks. We actually have a live caller on the line from California. So. Hi, uh, my question is, if the product name changes uh, after a grace period, is there a way to change the uh, device identifier on uh, the Access Good ID without having to create a new DI if the part number stays the same? So you are talking about when you say product name changes, uh, I'm going to assume it's the brand name change. Is that correct? Yeah. So if the brand name changes, then um, we talked about new DI triggers in the presentation. Brand name is a new DI trigger. So in Good ID, we basically say if you change data elements that are new DI triggers, then a new device identifier would be required. So we would say that that would warrant a um, new device identifier. Right. Um, anything to add to that? Yeah, you can look up which data elements are new DI triggers in the Good ID Data Elements Reference Table. This is an excellent reference, and I encourage everybody to, to go to our website and find this resource. I mean, it, it was downloaded 10,000 times last year. We all have dog-eared, you know, restapled copies of this. It's such a great resource. It's called the Good ID Data Elements Reference Table. You can see the edit rules after the grace period. You can see the new DI triggers for different data elements. It's, it's a great resource. So it sounds like you would need a new DI record yes. if you're changing your name. Does that answer your question, caller? Uh, yes, but what if the uh, part number stays the same? I don't think you can, you wouldn't be able, you'd have to assign a new part number then, correct? You know, I guess the part number, I would say, would be really, um, it's probably something that you use for your um, management of your devices through the supply chain. As you know, in Good ID, we do not capture part numbers. So um, unless you, you know, you may have to assign a new version or a model. That's something you may want to consider. If the device changed and you're changing the brand name and you're changing the version or a model, then it requires a new device identifier. Since we don't capture part numbers, I would say that's really up to you how you manage that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Then let's return to our next question. Does the good ID publish date indicate compliance to the UDI requirements? And should a company hold off on the published date until the compliance date? So um, the good ID published date, as we said again in the, I'm gonna refer back to the presentation, is uh, the date that you submit your device record in good ID, the published date is what uh, we deem to be in compliance with good ID submission requirements. So. As you know, we do have those compliance dates, and you are required to submit your devices by that compliance date if they are currently in commercial distribution. Um, so yes, you will meet the Good ID submission requirements if you um, submit your device records, and the published date would be the date that we would have um, deemed to you to have uh, complied with the requirements. 
Additionally, um, <clears throat> if you are asking, the, you asked the question about should I wait to submit Correct. it? That was going to be the Our next recommendation would be really do not wait. If you currently have devices that are in commercial distribution and you know that you need to get them in by September 2016, we say go ahead and submit them. You may put the published date to be September 24th um, of 2016. That would be all right but um, don't wait to actually send your record through whether you're using SPL or actually entering them if you're using the web interface. As, you, as we noted in the presentation, the system will actually take care of moving them to the published state on September 24th, so you will be in compliance. Uh, but we, don't, we, require, we request that you don't wait till the last date and you actually submit it so we are able to manage um, the peak submission volumes that we are expecting later this summer. And I guess, as I mentioned, this is a kind of a design in our system to allow data quality. So you submit yes. your data with a published date that is future. That gives you enough time to review the submitted data. And then you have a grace period 30 days yes. after to make sure everything is correct. Perfect. Awesome. But if I'm understanding, so if you've done everything you're supposed to do, have done that good quality data checks and done everything that puts it in place, there's no reason though to wait until September 24th. No reason to no. wait. And if, if you really want to, again, they could future date it so that the date, the published date is set to be September 2016, but you can actually send it in and have the system save that information. Okay. And have that ready. Yeah. Okay. Next question. We have one product with different sizes and catalog numbers. Can we have different device identifier records for each of them? Different sizes and catalog numbers. Correct. Right. Um, actually, you will need to have different DIs because each um, version or model or size uh, will require a new device identifier um, for the device. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's what it sounds like. Okay. What is the way in which we can edit some of the attributes like FDA listing number, kit, brand name, et cetera, which are not editable? So that sounds So again, we'll go back to um, what we said about data quality and baking in data quality. Um, what we have designed our system in such a way that you can submit your data as far advanced as you want until and put your published date uh, be the uh, compliance date. So you have this time to review and ensure that the data is correct. We suggest that and we ask that this time be used as such. Um, if by any chance um, you've passed um, the um, timeline for editing uh, the device, the published date has passed, the grace period has passed, and now you don't have, um, uh, you have a data element that needs to be edited, um, you have to submit a help this case, and we will have to consider uh, that case. This is going to be very manual and labor intensive, and we recommend that hopefully we will not have to take that route. So it sounds like get all of your information together first, make sure it's correct, double check it again to make sure it meets those quality indicators that you guys have talked about, and then go forward with it. Because right. once you get to a certain point, it becomes very difficult to change or make any edits. That is correct. Okay, That's a good message to, to take home. Yeah. Does the good ID need to be in the published status in order to export the data, or can it be done in the unpublished status? Right, so exporting of data can be done uh, for all your records regardless of the status. You can filter by the status um, in the, on the Good ID web interface if you log in. You can filter and say export only the unpublished records for my organization or export only the published records or export all records. Okay. So it's, it's really a great tool to export your records, make sure they match up with your source system data and make any corrections so you avoid having to come to us and say, can you please help us correct this data now that the grace period has passed and this particular data element can no longer be edited. Okay, so the system was designed to do this. Yes, yes. yes. Good. 
You had a slide that indicated that one of the GMDN global medical device nomenclature codes should be sufficient for most devices. But does the good ID accept more than one GMDN code for a single device? Yes, our system is capable of accepting multiple GMDN codes, uh, but we think that uh, usually one GMDN code should be sufficient to uh, categorize your device. So you can do more than one, but probably shouldn't. Right. Yeah, right. If you're finding that you feel that more than one code applies, yeah, take a closer look. And right. you might even want to work with the GMDN agency. Um, they continue to revise their codes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. that's so a good living, point. Yeah. Right. So yeah, they can point. submit multiples, but we feel majority of the um, cases probably they would probably wouldn't need more than one. That is correct. But if there are instances where they may need to submit and it makes sense, mm -hmm. the system will allow it. Okay. Good. Does the good ID need to be in the published stat? Okay. We actually this is a repeat. If a good ID record is published and then the company changes its address. Will the new address be obtained automatically from the DUNS number? Does the manufacturer need to do anything besides update the address associated with the DUNS number? If they've had an, an, an excuse me, <clears throat> if the labeler has had an address change in DUNS, all they need to do is contact us through the help desk and let us know to update their information in Good ID. It's an easy um, direct pull from the DUNS database. We just have to know to do it. Okay, so they so, will match up that they just need to let you know that exactly. the address has changed, not mm -hmm. actually have to go in and do anything themselves. Right, but we don't automatically, so if they update it uh, with DNB, but they don't inform us, we don't know no. to pull it. Exactly. So yeah. they have to update it and they need to let us know, and then we know that that particular organization information needs to be refreshed, and we'll go and pull updated data from DNB sort of on demand. Okay. So all they need to do is make sure it's correct with DNB, ping us and tell us, you know, I need to update my information in good ID and we'll, we'll be able to take care of that. Okay. So it sounds like if I'm changing my address, I go to DNB, Duns and Bradstreet, and then I just call and let you guys know that I've changed that information right. in Duns and Bradstreet's and good ID takes it from there. Yes. Okay. We'll submit a help desk submit a help request. Desk. Okay, yeah. Submit a help desk They can't request. actually call us directly. <laughs> no, that's true. And that's but, a great point to put out is that actually they do need to contact through the help desk itself. Right. Yeah. Because okay. yeah. the goal is that the, the label or DUNS information should match the address that's on the device label so that somebody can look at their device label and see the company name and address on the label and in the database. Please. Make that match. Okay. Yes. And that's important. If a new device is 510K cleared after the applicable compliance date, how soon must the good ID be submitted after the clearance date or the marketing date? So I submitted my 510K, I now get my substantial equivalence letter, and I want to now go and put it into distribution. When do I need to go and do my submission for good ID? Ideally, the record should be in good ID prior to commercial distribution. Okay. However, um, you know, we know that there are sometimes good ideas down or for whatever reason you're unable to get your submission through. We do provide a 15-day grace period. Okay. So you need to get your record into good ID either prior to commercial distribution or within 15 days of having your device in commercial distribution. Okay. Is the brand name the description of the device that appears on the label and catalog? Else. Say that again, I'm sorry. Is the brand name the description of the device that appears on the label and catalog? Uh, the brand name would be the uh, name that appears on the label of the device, and it's um, mostly a trademarked or registered name uh, that um, you know is, is uh, the device is known for. Um, and usually the same name is uh, used in the catalogs to, for uh, sales or marketing. So they match up between they match up, right. whatever the promotional material that's being used in whatever catalogs should match whatever the actual information in the good ID. Right. Mostly we're concerned with the label, label of the device. Yes. I mean the yes. label. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> New term. Right. <laughs> Can you have multiple data entry users working on the same device identifier at the same time? 
multiple data entry users. I believe the system will let have multiple people and it is going to be, if I am logged in and Heather is logged in and we both pull up the same DI record and I hit save, the system will save it. And then if she, and I'm still in that same record and if Heather comes in and hits save, the system will overwrite what I had saved. So it's, it's you know, the last save wins. Okay. So whoever hits save at the last time, that's what wins. And if I'm not aware she's making changes to that record, then um, I think that I made all my changes and I'm good to go. But if Heather comes in and she edits that record two seconds later and hits save, whatever changes she made is what will be in good ID. Okay. So it's important, you know, to have good... Um, operating procedures and who has access to good ID, who is responsible for which records and how the information is saved and how it matches up with source system. So the system will allow two people to access the record, but it's the, the last person last is person. whose information yeah. ends up there. Yes. Okay. Another question. What information am I supposed to submit for the devices in a convenience kit? So this is going off a little bit differently. So uh, when we're talking about convenience kits and kits, uh, the DI record must represent, the information in the DI record must re represent all the components of uh, the kit. Um, for example, you ha we have um, a um, data element for sterility. If all components of the kit are sterile, then you can call that, uh, you know, the whole thing, kit, uh, kit as sterile. If every component in the uh, kit is latex-free, then you can call that uh, kit latex-free. Um, right now, we don't have a way of capturing all the components of the um, uh, kit separately in our system. So we recommend that you use the description field and enter uh, as much description about the components that are in the kit. Additionally, the storage and handling are um, data elements that are kind of confusing for kid. Um, but there is a way that we can, you can enter text for these mm -hmm. data elements, and normally we don't recommend using the text field. Uh, and, and, but in this case, since we don't have a way mm -hmm. of capturing the components, uh, we recommend that you type in as text what the component is and what the size is if um, there are different sizes of different items in your kit and you'd like to specify them. Okay, and all that information goes into the Good ID, which then actually brings up the next question, which is from Good ID, this information after you've done your good quality track ends up in Access Good ID. Someone's asking, is anyone currently using Access Good ID? Oh, yes. <laughs> we had. Um about 150,000 hits last month. Our usage numbers um, climb as people submit more and more records, um, the, the usage numbers climb too. We have over 500,000 records yes. in Good ID right now. Wow. So, uh, and over the next six months, as we get to our next compliance date, we expect that number to go up sharply. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Access Good ID is very popular. The, the search and download functions are very popular. Um, for our technical users, we have RSS feeds and APIs, including a UDI parser, which breaks a UDI down into its component, um, the DI and the individual PIs. Um, we have advanced search that's coming out very shortly. So um, yeah, Access Good ID is um, being used, and it sounds like it's going to be used yeah, even more and more, more as time continues mm -hmm. to roll on. Yeah. I want to add that you know, Office of National Coordinators um, new rule that requires electronic health record be um, um, certified with an implant list uh, in, in the future. And they refer to this website very much mm -hmm. and they refer uh, the electronic health record users to use our data as a source for lookup and use the APIs for uh, help with looking up uh, this data set. Mm -hmm. We have two APIs. We have an implantables list and an implantables download that are specifically for implantables. Right. Okay, next question that I have, can you discuss what a unit of use device identifier is and how it is obtained? So a unit of use, yes. and I think we saw a little bit of that in the right. presentation. Right, we introduced it. So unit of use, uh, the purpose of unit of use device identifier, I guess first of all it's a div another type of device identifier, and the purpose is really to associate the use of a device on a patient 
when a UDI is not on the device at the level of its unit of use. So an example could be uh, a package of six surgical knots, for example. That's the uh, base package. Surgical knots are things that you use to really um, tie the knots on sutures. And if you have a base package, now again, base package is the lowest level of a package that actually has the full UDI on it. So in this case, uh, let's say the base package has six surgical knots on it and the individual knots inside the package don't actually have a UDI on it. And now you use that on a patient, now you want to know how many were actually used on a patient and you would like to identify them um, specifically and that's where the unit of use comes into play. Um, it's actually an unmarked DI, so the device identifier will not be on the label. The unit of use device identifier won't be on the label. It, it's not because it's a six, six mm -hmm. um, pack of six, has a primary DI, and the knot itself inside are all together, so the knot won't have the DI, but it would be unmarked, and the labeler would have to assign those, and the same issuing agency rules that they use to assign the primary DI would apply. They would assign a device identifier, and that would be unmarked. They maintain it in their system, source system, and they also submit it to Good ID. And whenever the primary DI is scanned at the patient bedside, if they have um, systems to pull that information from a source such as Good ID, Good ID using the APIs that Heather was talking about, it would also pull the unit of use along with it to the patient's electronic health record. So you would have that unit of use DI that gets pulled into the patient's record, and then you can note out of the six in this pack, I use three on this patient, and then you have a way to account for how many were used on a patient. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. Can you explain the optional fields? When is an optional field required to have an entry? Well, so um, in our database, um, we have many fields that uh, are collected, but um, we think that um, even though we are calling them optional, when they're applicable, uh, we recommend that they would be uh, populated. Uh, for example, the catalog number in, in our database uh, is not a required data element, but um, in a recent uh, um, project I was working on, a pilot that was looking at using uh, UDI data in registries, uh, we found how important the catalog number is to link up the uh, data as we are moving forward with UDI uh, and the data that has been captured in the registry. So it's very important to have every data element that is uh, in our system, when applicable, filled out. Okay. And I want to suggest, again, think about the end user that will be looking at this data and access Good ID, trying to learn more about your device. Um, that device description field, for example, is wholly optional, but it appears at the very top of a record in Access Good ID, and it's one of the main ways that people use to identify a device record, so, or identify a device. So it's, um, it's great to fill this out. We've seen device descriptions that include links to safety and effectiveness information. Yes. I mean, this field has so much potential. It's a great opportunity to really um, give people a lot of information about a device. So it's, it's technically optional, um, but again, it's, it's an opportunity. Yes, and I think that's important because you're getting back now to the intent of why right. this is happening yes. and yeah. why this is going on. And I think from a labeler perspective, I think it becomes important that they understand that intent so that they get the most out of this right. as well, mm -hmm. since it's going to be that labeler's information that's out there. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So. Okay. The next question. I contract out my device manufacturing. Do I need a good ID account, or can the contract manufacturer use their account and submit the information on my device to good ID? So this sort of goes back to an earlier question, I think. So if you contract out manufacturing, then you are having someone else um, manufacture your devices for you. And if your contract manufacturer is also labeling and um, assigning a UDI, you would still need to assign your device identifier mm -hmm. on that. So you would provide that information and then the manufacturer could manufacture the device, print the label, put your UDI on it, your brand name on it, and then you are still the labeler. Now you need to make sure the data is entered into Good ID. Now can you have the contract, the manufacturer also 
enter the information. That, that as well. Yes, of course you can, but the account has to be under the labeler's name. So you would need to, the, the, the manufacturer would have to establish a good ID account in the labeler's name, and then they can do all the entering of information. It is possible. Okay. But the responsibility for making sure the submission took place, that the data quality is correct, and the information is uploaded would all fall on the uh, labeler. Okay. So you would still be held accountable, and if we have any questions on the information, we would come to the labeler. Um, you know, and if you choose to use someone else to enter the information, that's completely possible and fine to do. So you could have that even if it wasn't a contract manufacturer. Yes. But they, you still, as the labeler, have that final responsibility exactly. both on making sure it's done as well as all the information that's right. submitted. And, and we talked about, I think, third-party submitters in the presentation who are people who would submit information on behalf of the labeler to Good ID. So that's the other way to get information entered. Okay. Good. Is the good ID now accepting information on class two devices? Yes, yes. absolutely. We are open to class two. Uh, I believe we opened um, accounts for class two on February 1st, and we've been made doing brisk business okay. in opening okay. accounts. We've opened uh, plenty of accounts since we opened up on in February. It's been about a month. Um, so if you are a class two labeler, yes, um, send your account request in. Let's get you going and let's get you started. Mm -hmm. Now is a great time to get started. We're six months out from the compliance date, especially if you plan to submit through HL7 SPL. You have testing ahead of you, um, ESG right. testing and HL7 testing. So yeah, start early. It's, it's great. It's great to hear from people that are interested in getting started early. Yep. So it sounds like you guys are open for business and yes. you want the business yes. now, <laughs> not September. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> we want to you know, help people and I think uh, as summer months pick up, things are going to get very, very busy. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd rather see people come in when there is still time and make sure that they have the opportunity to get all their questions answered and you know, they have time to learn the system correctly and do it instead of rushing through things. As well as take their time making sure that that data quality yes, is, right. is at the level it should be. Absolutely. So, I, I agree with you. I think earlier is better. Okay, next question. Do you have to resubmit your good ID information if a part number changes in barcode standard for HIBEC or GS1? Part number changes for a barcode standard? Um, again, we don't capture part numbers in Good ID. Really, when you would need to submit or resubmit, um, by resubmit, I think if they mean updating record, yes, you, you would need to update records when it's necessary to update. But if your model or version changes, it's not a resubmit, it's you have to assign a new device identifier. Correct. So if um, the, any change uh, results in their device identifier, change, then of course they have to submit that information uh, to Good ID and, and update their records. Okay. What is the purpose of the commer commercialization distribution end date? Um, so commercial distribution end date really indicates when a labeler is no longer commercially distributing that product or rather selling that product. So <clears throat> if you are a labeler, you enter a device record in Good ID, and you decide for whatever reason that you're no longer going to commercially distribute it, you would come to Good ID and you would update that device record and say commercial distribution end date is March 10th. The system will reflect the status to say this device is no longer in commercial distribution, but the record will continue to stay in Good ID because the device may still be out there being used by patients and healthcare providers. So the record will always be in good ID. It will just show that this labeler is no longer selling this particular product. Okay. And, and would you recommend that they do that when they've manufactured or when the labeler has manufactured those last lots or devices, that that's when they would do that or? Yeah, it's whenever they decide to stop. Uh, yes, whenever they end commercially distributing that product. Um, right, is when they should. We got a help desk question where they were trying to put a future date in that uh, field. And we recommend that, you know, unless, and the future date was year 99999, um, very far, far in the okay. future. We recommend that you leave that field blank right. until you know exactly what date, date your commercial distribution end date is. 
You yeah. know, another good example of this is uh, we are seeing mergers and acquisitions. We are working with labelers who are undergoing mergers and acquisitions mm -hmm. right now. So if I have a company that Heather um, buys and she decides to give it a, take all my products, give it a new brand name, give it a new device identifier, then once I am done selling the lots that I have manufactured and I no under longer am putting that name. under my name, yeah. I would go into Good ID and I would update all of them and put a commercial distribution end date and in all the records would show no longer in commercial distribution. And then Heather would have entered new device records for the new brand name and the new DIs. So both records would exist and consumers would know which one is no longer being sold currently and which one is currently in. And it would also tell you where one brand name to end and the yes. new brand name began. Yes, we are working actually on that enhancement to make such a link that would show that this particular device was previously owned by this different, yeah, was previously owned by me and now it's it's a device that Heather's making. We're working on that enhancement right now. Oh, that's very important. So. And you had something? Yes, yeah, similarly there's a, a packaging configuration end date. Um, where oh yes. Do you want to talk about uh, that? <laughs> sure, so, so packages, thank you Heather, um, there is a package status, um, package discontinue date. Um, so if I am making products and I have multiple higher level package configurations, I may decide to discontinue a package of 20 but continue selling a package of 10. So if I discontinue selling a package of 20, then I would want to come and update my DI record and put a package discontinue date, which would then show the package status to say that it is discontinued. But then the package of 10 would still be there. And again, all this discontinue and commercial distribution end date the record will always be in good ID. So I, I think it's important to, for labelers to know once you submit a record, it's always going to be available. You may update the statuses, but the record is never removed from good ID, even if you stop selling that product. So make sure that you put correct information in because it's there to stay. Okay, that's good, good advice. Make sure you have that, the correct information. Yeah. Okay. I have maybe time for one more question or two more questions. I got an account and a username password. I log in, but I can't enter records. What's wrong? Okay, yeah, we talked about this a little bit um, earlier. Um, it sounds like they might be logging in as a coordinator, so what they need to do is just log in as a label or data entry user. But we get this question a lot, so it doesn't hurt to, to reiterate this. Yes. Um, if, if, if you run into this problem, just make sure that you're logged in as a label or data entry user and create a label or data entry user account for yourself if you need to. Because when you first get your account, you'll just get your coordinator login. So now I would say it's important to um, look and understand the different user roles mm -hmm. and what each user, what functionalities each user role um, comes with in Good ID, so that they're you know they're able to manage the record act better. Okay, so it sounds like it's important also to know what role each individual has yes. when they're dealing with the system itself, right. and that. If you don't know your role, you may find yourself locked out at being able to see certain information. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's a good way to put it. Okay. Very important. Okay. I have one last question that's come in. We're trying to decide between submitting via web and using HL7 SPL. Um, I know we're going to talk about HL7 SPL in our next session coming up. But if you could touch just a little bit about what are the advantages of each, each submission? So each has you know, their own advantages. The web, again, is suitable for those who have a small volume of records and who probably do not have a large IT um, staff to um, work on generating XML files and, and so on. So it's definitely for those of you who don't have large IT staff or large volume of submissions, I would recommend the web. I think it's easy to use. Once you learn it, it's, it's not hard. We provide you a copy feature where you can copy, a, you can enter a, a, a template, you can copy over and then just change things uh, applicable to the new device that you're planning to enter. So it's definitely easy to use. You can manage it and you can see what's happening right in front of you. And um, so web, web has all of those advantages. Now the SPL is, if you have thousands and thousands of DI submissions, um, probably SPL option is better. And again, you'll learn a lot about that in the 
um, you know, next session. Next session. It, it, but definitely it's more resource intensive and requires uh, more um, upfront time to prepare, to set up, to do all the testing, which you'll hear about. So I would say attempt SPL if you have the bandwidth and the necessary resources to spend on it. Um, if not, it's probably better to stick to the web option. Okay. So it sounds like if I want to do SPL, I should listen in yes. for the next <laughs> half an hour mm -hmm. to 45 minutes. So right. thank you again for all the great information that we've heard here now. So. Thank you for your participation and for your thoughtful questions. This concludes our segment on the Good ID Device Identifier Record. We hope you found this program informative. We have a survey that you'll find on our website. We'd like to hear from you as this helps us to plan future programs that meet your regulatory needs. That link is being shown on the screen now. Let's now transition to our second topic of the day. HL7 SBL submission option. At the conclusion of this presentation, we'll bring back another expert panel for an interactive question and answer session with you. See you in a little while. Hi, my name is Linda Sig, and welcome to the Global Unique Device Identification Database, or GoodID, HL7 SPL submission option session. This module covers HL7 SPL submissions to the Good ID. There is another submission option, the web interface, that is covered in a separate module. In today's presentation, we will start off with an overview of the Good ID HL7 SPL submission option, talk about the required testing that is necessary before you send production Good ID submissions, examine the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway, or ESG, which is what you will use to send your HL7 SPL submissions to GoodID, explain the three acknowledgments you will receive and the purpose of each of them, share with you some helpful pointers on using the HL7 SPL submission option, such as how to edit and manage your DI records and how to use third-party submitters, and provide information on whom to contact and when for help. Let's start with the basics, which include a few acronyms. HL7 is Health Level 7, a standards development organization that works in the healthcare domain. They develop messaging standards that facilitate seamless exchange of healthcare information. SPL is Structured Product Labeling, and as the name implies, SPL captures label information. The FDA has taken the HL7 SPL standard and constrained it to the Good ID use case. Labelers must gather their medical device information and format it as an HL7 SPL XML message. Each XML file contains one DI record, and the technical specifications you need to create the XML file are available on our website. Once you have your Good ID HL7 SPL XML file, you then send it to us using the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway, or ESG. We will talk more about the ESG in a few minutes. We want to make sure the information is formatted correctly and loads to the Good ID correctly. Therefore, testing is required prior to sending these files to the Good ID production system, and we will talk more about that as well. The HL7 SPL submission option is resource intensive, so it is suitable for those with a large volume of submissions. Let's learn about the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway. The ESG enables secure receipt and authentication of FDA electronic regulatory submissions. The ESG serves the entire agency and it routes submissions to the appropriate center. This is important because if you already have an ESG account for other submissions to CDRH or one of the other FDA centers, you do not need a new account to use the ESG to submit your information to the Good ID. The ESG offers two submission options, Web Trader and AS2. Remember we said each XML file contains one DI record, and that is true no matter which ESG option you choose. Web Trader is a web portal where the user logs in and uploads one submission or file at a time. AS2, or Applicability Statement 2, is a communications protocol, and this option is a gateway to gateway connection. The labeler's gateway communicates directly with the ESG. The labeler sends their submissions through their gateway to the ESG using the AS2 protocols, 
and the ESG picks up the submissions and processes them. If you are considering using WebTrader as the primary mode for your ESG submissions, then we suggest you consider using the GoodID web interface instead of HL7 SPL submissions. The resources necessary for you to submit using HL7 SPL and upload one XML file at a time with WebTrader may not provide you with any payoff. With AS2, you can load many files at once to send to the ESG. Also note that GoodID does not use the eSubmitter tool used for EMDR submissions. Acknowledgements are sent for each stage of ESG report transmission, and we will look at that in detail in a minute. The ESG website shown on the slide has a wealth of in-depth information on all of the ESG topics. Please go to www.fda.gov ESG to access user guides, checklists, and tutorials. It's very important to remember that the ESG needs to know the center and submission type for every submission that comes through the ESG. For good ID, make sure to specify the center as CDRH and the submission type as good ID. Here is how the acknowledgements work. The labeler sends an HL7 SPL submission through the ESG and specifies the center as CDRH and the submission type as good ID. The ESG receives the submission and sends the acknowledgement, or ACK1, back to the labeler to indicate the ESG received your file. The file does not get opened, validated, or reviewed at this point. The ESG sees the center specified as CDRH and sends the submission to CDRH. The ESG then sends the ACK2, telling the labeler that the submission has been sent to CDRH. CDRH then routes the submission to GoodID where it gets processed. And GoodID sends the ACK3, telling the labeler the submission passed or failed validation. As you can see, ACK1 and ACK2 are sent by the ESG, and all questions related to ACK1 and ACK2 must go to the ESG Help Desk at esghelpdesk at fda.hhs.gov. Act 3 issues should be sent to the UDI Help Desk at goodidsupport at fda.hhs.gov. If you open the acknowledgements, they will look something like this. The Act 1 is your receipt for your submission or your message disposition notification. The ESG sends this and it just tells you that the ESG received your file and a message ID is provided. Act 2, again, the ESG sends this, and it tells you that the file was sent to the right center. A message ID and a core ID are provided. And as you can see at the bottom of the message, the Act 2 states that CDRH has received your submission. Act 3 is sent by Good ID, and it tells you if your submission passed or failed validation. The Act 3 contains the same core ID from the Act 2. If the submission fails validation, you may also see an act called unidentified or unparsable submission type. Unidentified means we don't know what kind of submission it is, so we can't route it to the right place in CDRH. It could be an MDR or a good ID. Remember to indicate submission type as good ID in the ESG submission header. Unparsable means we were unable to parse your submission because it failed validation against the Good ID schema that is provided in our HL7 SPL implementation package. Be sure to validate your submission before you submit it. This is the most commonly seen error when users first start testing. For all questions on your submissions or missing acknowledgements, you need to contact the correct help desk and you need to provide us with some information. If you have issues with Act 1 and Act 2, or if they are missing, please contact the ESG Help Desk and provide the message ID. If you did not receive the Act 1 and you do not have a message ID, then provide as much information as possible. If you have issues with Act 3, or you are missing the Act 3, please contact the Good ID Help Desk and provide the Core ID. Please do not automatically retransmit submissions if you are having issues. It is better and issues can be resolved faster if you contact the appropriate help desk first and work with them to figure out if there is a problem with the submission or the acknowledgements. Here we lay out the various steps and the process required to get ready to submit HL7 SPL production submissions to GoodID. On the top, you see that the first step is to begin gathering your data using the HL7 SPL implementation guide 
and work on your XML file generation. While you work on that, you can start the ESG and the Good ID account processes. Remember you need an account for both ESG and Good ID. Once you have your HL7 SPL formatted data and your accounts, you may begin testing. On the left, you see the steps for ESG testing. On the right, you see the steps for the Good ID testing. Before we go into the details of each, let's talk about timing. Please be sure to allocate plenty of time. The expectation is that you may need as long as 12 weeks, depending on the number of testing iterations you need to reach success. Here is more detail on the ESG testing process. Just like the Good ID, the ESG starts with a test account. To request and obtain an ESG test account, you need to obtain a digital certificate, exchange the public key with ESG, and send a letter of non-repudiation, which indicates who can submit on behalf of your organization and that your digital signature is the same as your WET signature. To complete your ESG testing, the ESG requires a connectivity test and a load test. You should allocate a total of two to four weeks for the ESG testing process. As we said before, if you have an existing ESG test account from another program in the agency or in CDRH, you may use the same account. If you already have an existing ESG test account, no additional ESG testing is necessary, but Good ID testing is still required. When you send your Good ID test submissions through the ESG, be sure to specify the center as CDRH and the submission type as Good ID. Hopefully, while you've been obtaining an ESG test account and performing ESG testing, you have also been putting together the Good ID HL7 SPL XML files. When you generate the XML file for the DI record, be sure to validate your file against the Good ID schema. Remember I mentioned the unparsable error. This is the most common error we see during the Good ID testing process, so it will save you time if you validate your file before submitting. You may request a Good ID test account through the Good ID account request process and indicate that you need a test account. Submit your XML files using your ESG test account and make sure you complete all of the required test scenarios. The files that you submit through your ESG test account will move through the ESG and load in the Good ID test area. Submit your test scenario results for review to the UDI help desk. Follow the instructions in the Good ID test scenarios document to make sure you submit the right information. FDA staff will review your submission and, if successful, issue you the production, ESG, and Good ID accounts. Then you may submit your HL7 SPL submission to Good ID by way of the ESG in the production area. Here are some important things to remember about the ESG and Good ID. As we said before, the ESG serves the entire FDA with many centers and many submission types. The ESG and Good ID both have completely separate and isolated test and production areas. Submissions sent through the ESG test account will load to the Good ID test system and submissions sent through the ESG production account will load to the Good ID production system. Many labelers prefer to use third parties for their HL7 SPL submissions. A third party is a company or individual authorized to submit device information to the Good ID on behalf of the labeler. The labeler must provide third party information during the Good ID account request process. If the third party is not associated to the labeler's Good ID account, the submission from the third party will be rejected. Third parties provide different levels of service. They may provide just the software solution or tool to the labeler to generate HL7 SPL XML files, and then the labeler sends the submissions through the ESG. In this case, the labeler must obtain the ESG account and complete all the required ESG and Good ID testing or the third party may provide an end-to-end -end solution. The third party uses the labeler's data to generate the XML files and then sends the submissions to the ESG on behalf of the labeler. In this case, the third party obtains the ESG account. Third parties who want to develop solutions and tools to generate Good ID HL7 SPL XML files to sell to their clients are given Good ID test accounts so they can use it to develop and test their solution. Labelers who intend to use a third-party submitter must still request a test Good ID account and must complete the Good ID testing process, either on their own or along with their third-party submitter. 
You may wonder why individual labelers must complete Good ID testing if they are using an experienced third-party submitter. The answer is that the data drives the business rules in Good ID, and each labeler's data set is unique. Each labeler must perform Good ID testing with their data. Whether or not labelers use a third-party submitter, the labeler is responsible for fulfilling the Good ID submission requirements. The labeler must ensure submissions are received and processed by the FDA. You should log in to the Good ID and view your records to make sure they are correct. The labeler is also responsible for reporting by the compliance date and for all record keeping. For those of you who are third-party solution providers, you may test your Good ID HL7 SPL submission solution independently of the labelers. Request a Good ID test account and indicate it is for HL7 SPL testing. Dummy data for certain required attributes will be provided for testing purposes only upon request. Good ID web interface access is not provided, and Good ID production accounts are not provided. As you work with labelers, third party submitters must complete Good ID HL7 SPL testing with each labeler using the labeler's data. Also, make sure to use the labeler's Good ID test account. Now that we have gone through the HL7 SPL submission process, here are some key pointers to keep in mind. It is important to read the Good ID Guidance for Industry and FDA Staff document because it describes the DI record lifecycle, how to set up packages, and more. Don't limit your reading to just the HL7 SPL package of files. Allow adequate time for testing both the ESG and Good ID. We estimate 12 weeks based on past experience, and it goes faster if the labeler has done the upfront work and testing to make sure the records are complete and correct. The Good ID testing completion criteria is the bare minimum. The process is easier for everyone involved if there is thorough internal testing to ensure the scenarios appropriate for your products are accounted for. Validate your submissions against the Good ID HL7 SPL schema. If you do not validate, then you will likely encounter the unparsable error message that I mentioned on the acknowledgments slide. Do not submit the sample message that we provided in the HL7 SPL implementation package as a test submission. It is not validated. When submitting via the ESG, please specify the center is CDRH and the submission type is Good ID. If the submissions are not electronically delivered to the right place, then you will experience the unidentified error message that I mentioned on the acknowledgments slide. Make sure to follow the submission folder structure. The top level folder must be uniquely named. The lower level folder must always be named SPL and there can only be one SPL folder. The Good ID HL7 SPL XML submission file must be named submission.xml and this is the only file that can be in the SPL folder. That means there is only one submission or DI record in each folder structure. If you do not follow the correct folder structure, then you will receive the unidentified error because the DI record is not packaged correctly and the system cannot extract the submission from the folder structure and read the file. Note that you cannot submit draft DI records via the HL7 SPL submission option. Records can be submitted as unpublished, where the DI record publish date is in the future, or published, where the DI record publish date is today. During testing, it is important that after your submission is submitted and loaded, you review it via the web interface. Log in as a Labeler Data Entry, or LDE, user, and the Labeler DUNS number for that DI record should be assigned to you and show in your list. Verify that the information you sent in the XML file has loaded correctly. For those labelers using a third-party submitter, you are not finished when you send the data to your third-party submitter. You are still responsible for your data and you need to make sure it is loaded correctly to Good ID. In the Good ID web interface, if you click on the View History hyperlink on the DI record, you will see the username specified as SPL user for all records submitted via the HL7 SPL submission option. Let's talk briefly about data quality. As you know, Good ID is the master repository of device identification information, and we want to make sure that information is complete and correct, so it is imperative that good quality data is submitted. 
So how can you ensure good quality? I already described the process before you move to production. Complete internal testing for all of your different product areas and verify your test records are loaded correctly by logging into the GoodID web interface and reviewing them. After you move to production, you need to continuously monitor, review, and correct records. There is a grace period in GoodID that is 30 days. During this time, you can edit all data elements in the GoodID DI record except the publish date. Please use this time to review your information. You can also use the export feature to export all your records in GoodID as XML files and compare the data against your source system data and make corrections. The records are displayed in our public portal, Access GoodID, after the grace period ends. So reviewing your records for the first time once they are available in Access GoodID does not help. At that point, it is too late. I know I've already said that the labeler is responsible for their data in GoodID, so I will say it a different way. Once the data is available in Access GoodID, it is available to the public for use in searches, downloads, and lookups. It is your data, and we all want the data to be of good quality, so please help us make sure it is complete and correct from the start. You can edit your HL7 SPL submissions. When you want to make a change to a DI record, submit the entire DI record, both the changed and unchanged portions of it. The DI record will be completely replaced in GoodID with the most recent information in the XML file. The document.setID attribute in the HL7 SPL submission file links all related submissions, so for each edit, you need to retain and provide the same setID. The document.version number attribute in the HL7 SPL submission file tracks versions, so you need to increment this by one each time you edit and resubmit, even for failed submissions. For example, if you send a submission and assign document.version number equal to one, and receive a failed ACK3, then increment the document.version number to 2 before you resubmit. And a second example, if you review your data in GoodID via the web interface, either before the record is published or during the grace period after it is published, and notice an issue with the submission, fix the error, increment the document.version number, and resubmit. As you know, there are two submission options for GoodID, the web interface and HL7 SPL. You may choose either option to submit, and we recommend you use the same submission option for the life of the DI record to maintain the data consistency. But we realize that is not always possible. There are some restrictions for editing DI records, depending on where it is in the life cycle. Records entered using the web interface must be edited using the web interface as long as it is in the draft or unpublished state or in the published state during the grace period. You cannot edit a web interface record using HL7 SPL until after it has published and passed the grace period. Records submitted using HL7 SPL may be edited at any time using either HL7 SPL or the web interface. After you make it all the way through the HL7 SPL testing process, here are some tips for submitting in production. Start sending your submissions in small batches to make sure everything is working, and then slowly ramp up. Limit the number of submissions sent at one time to no more than 500 DI records. And if you do not receive acknowledgments, please contact us before resending the submissions so we can check to see if there is an issue. Scheduled downtimes for both the pre-prod testing area and production will be posted on our website under Good ID System Status. We will also post unscheduled downtimes as we become aware of them. If the system is down and there is no notice, please report this to the UDI Help Desk. You can subscribe to Good ID email alerts so that you are automatically notified of system outages, upgrades, and updates. There is a link on our website to subscribe. I hope you found the HL7 SPL information presented very informative. There is a wealth of information on our website regarding the HL7 SPL submission process, the testing requirements for ESG and GoodID, and how to edit your records. And finally, please contact the appropriate help desk to obtain help if you need it. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for viewing the presentation on the HL7 SBL submission option. 
I hope you found it informative. Again, I'm Joseph Tartle, Acting Deputy Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We're joined now by your presenter, Linda Sig, as well as another panel expert, Indira Kondori, who presented on the Good ID Device Identifier Record earlier. Both are members of the UEI team for CDRH's Office of Surveillance and Biometrics. Please remember, you can submit questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a thought bubble on the top left corner of your screen. You can also call the phone number you see on the screen now to ask your questions live. We're available to take your questions until 3 p.m. This is your time to interact with our medical device experts, so we'd love to hear from you. While we're waiting for your calls, we'll get started with some email questions that you've already submitted. And the first question I have here is, can we have both an HL7 SPL and a web account? So for good ID, you only need one account, and one account will serve your needs for both submission options, so you don't need two separate accounts. Um, however, it's good to determine early on what, the, what primary submission option a labeler would like to choose, and if you determine it to be HL7 SPL, then you would start with a pre-production or a test account, and then once you complete testing, um, as Linda talked about the testing process in the SVL uh, presentation that um, you all heard just now, you would then get a production account. Okay. So one account, you can use it for both submission options. Okay. So if web interface is the submission method, what validations would be necessary? If web interface is the submission um, option and then there is no testing required, if you mean by validation, if you're asking about if any testing is necessary, there is no testing necessary to get a web account. Um, if you want to submit using the web interface option, which is a manual data entry option, we will directly give you a production account. There is the draft DI record option, which can be used to learn the system and test the system and make sure that you know what the different user roles are and all the different DI record um, states are. So you would directly get a production account if you're using a web interface okay. option. Let me turn that question around. What if I was using the HL7 SPL method? What validations? Well, the HL7 SPL, uh, there's a validation process. So you do have a test account. Right. Okay. Um, you do submit test um, HL7 SPL submissions to the test account, to the test area. And then you submit your results to us, and we take a look at them. And if they pass, then we will hand you a production account, and you, you're off and running. Right. Okay. So there's differences between each one with regards to setting that up. Yes. Okay. How do we register as a label or data entry user? We've already registered as a coordinator through the opening of an account. So when you request a good ID account, um, regardless of which submission option, we ask that you also provide a coordinator user role. So you will provide us the coordinator um, information. We create the coordinator user account. And coordinators are the ones who um, can then create the labeler data entry users. So you, the labeler, with the coordinator user role, can create labeler data entry user accounts. And then you'll be able to start entering DI records. So the labelers can do that themselves. Okay. How do I sign up for a good ID account? Good, great question. Um, great question. Um, so in the presentation, the Industry Basics Part 1, okay. there is a um, whole module on the account request process. Um, I would encourage everyone to go to the website and to pull up Industry Basics Part 1 and look at the account request module. Um, to summarize quickly, there is a place on our website where you can request right. accounts, and we will send you the form and you fill it out and send it back. Um, for the account requests, we have found if people are, you know, know exactly what they need and they fill the account request out completely exactly. and there are no questions, we can handle it and turn it around in, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Every time we have to come back and ask a question or if there's, you know, th something isn't clear on the form, something hasn't been filled in correctly, et cetera, it just adds time to that process, mm -hmm. both for the labeler and for us. Um, we've had some account requests that have taken a really long time just because people needed help with the form. 
Um, about 50% of our account requests come through and we're able to handle them right away in one shot. Mm -hmm. uh, probably another 25 to 30%. Yes. There's one question, so it's not too bad. And then there's um, probably 15, 20% where it, there's some confusion and we have to go back and forth. Okay. But so. what it sounds like it would be a good idea if I were a labeler to first look at that module, find out all the information that I need and then go and do my account request so I don't have that back and forth. It makes it easier for me as well as easier for the DGI team as well. It is time well spent. Yes. Okay. It will save time in the long run. Yeah. If using the e-submitter option, which form should I choose to enter the data? Example, the medical device reports 3500A. So I think there might be some confusion okay. and maybe you can explain explain it to try to to clarify the e-submitter. Right, so good question. Um, good ID does not use e-submitter at all. So okay. e-submitter and good ID have no relation to each other. Instead of e-submitter, we actually provide you the good ID web interface option, which is very similar. You log into the good ID web application and you can enter records one at a time. So do not use e-submitter for good ID. The 3500A form doesn't um, have any corrected relation to the Good ID program. Um, you need neither. You just need access to Good ID web application, and you can enter your records and submit them directly to us. Correct. So eSubmitter is for medical device reporting yes. with the 3500A, not for UDI good and Good ID. Yes. Okay, perfect. Please point me to the correct resources at the FDA website that explains the generation and validation of XML files. So for that, you would go to our website. Our website actually, like Linda said, has you know, lots of resources that we have been working on since the UDI program went live and the rule was put together back in 2013. We have developed many resources for users and on the UDI website, if you navigate to the Good ID section of the UDI website, you then move on to the HL7 SPL um, section of the Good ID website. There is actually a package of files. We put together an entire package specific for HL7 SPL. Inside the package, it may look a little intimidating when you open it because there are many <laughs> files, but fear not. We have a um, a readme fust file that actually explains to you what all the different files in that are and what is the purpose and intent of each one. So we, we have done our best to make it easy for you to use it. So just download the package of files, look at the readme fust file, and that will tell you what everything is. And over time, um, we've been now, we've completed class three, we've completed um, life supporting implants and life sustaining device uh, labelers. Thanks to all of them and their feedback, um, all the material we have has in fact been refined, um, redone to really make it um, easier for folks to use. So go to the UDI website, navigate to the Good ID portion, and then navigate to the SBL website, and then you'll be able to find the information. Okay. So that you'll have those resources. Yep. Okay, and we're starting to get more of those HL7 SBL questions in. Can I, as a labeler, use the web interface submission method for my class two device now, and then later on use the HL7 SPL when I submit my class one device? Very good question. Absolutely, you can do that. Um, and the web interface is very um, much, very streamlined, very quick and easy to use, and it may be a very good option for people who don't have thousands of class two devices. If you only have a few hundred, that's probably a good option for you. Um, it does take a lot of time to set up the HL7 SPL, several weeks, um, and you wanna get that payoff. You wanna have a lot of um, device records. So think about your device universe, how many versions and models do you have, mm -hmm. class two, class one, um, you can absolutely submit through the web now and then switch over to the HL7 option for all of your submissions in the future. Uh, the only caveat is that uh, if you submit through the web, you cannot update those records through HL7 SPL until they have published and passed their grace period. So understand the um, edit rules, I guess, between the different submission options. And Linda, you've covered that in the right. presentation in detail. 
So it's absolutely possible, but um, labelers should just know to understand the, the how rules. to manage their device records through the life cycle of the device between the two submission options. Okay. And that information is available on the website and in the presentation too. Okay. I think that's very valuable. And going off of that, those numbers, we have the next question. The stakeholder has about 1,500 labels. Do you recommend the HL7 SPL or the web interface option? Which one do you think would be better if you were dealing with 1,500 labels? Wow. Well, that, re that really depends on um, your level of technical capability to follow the HL7 SPL process. Um, if you have good technical skills or you have a technical employee or you feel like hiring a consultant or a mm -hmm. third party, HL7 SPL for 1,500 records, you know, may be a good way to go. And you have to think about the life cycle. You're going to be updating those records in the future. You may have new versions and models in the future where you have to resubmit, you know, new DIs. So um, 1,500, you, it's kind of a borderline. You could go either way either on way. that one. Um, so I would, I would say it, it depends on you. It depends on the labeler situation. I mean, if they yeah. were, it's, it's also, you, they could hire labeler data entry person to um, enter the records manually, um, get them all the 1500 in, then it would just be editing and maintaining. So it really depends on the organization and their, like Linda said, the, the IT um, expertise that they have available. So it sounds it like is. numbers alone shouldn't be your deficient decision point, that there's other things, especially if you're dealing with you know, a thousand or two thousand labels that there's other decisions to think about as well. Right. Your technical competencies, who's going to do it and how. Yeah, I mean, 1,500, like Linda said, is probably a barter line. If you said 100 or 200, maybe we would say, oh, that's an open and shut case. Enter web interface, you're done. Manually enter them. Okay. And what if you were to say 5,000? Yeah. Maybe, maybe SPL, okay. probably. So you really need to look at it within those range and then think about the other aspects yes. and not just the right. numbers themselves. Right. Okay. For the HL7 SPL, how many files can you submit at a time? Well, it's, um, you can submit multiple files at a time, but remember, each DI record is one XML file inside the okay. folder structure. So uh, you can submit multiple XMLs in batches, though. So the, you know, as, a, as a brand new person coming in and doing SPL, I would say, you know, just like with anything, submit one get it to work, mm -hmm. maybe ramp up a little more, submit 10 or 20, get those to work, and then ramp up. Um, we would like to keep the batches to 500 as, as a maximum just so that we don't completely bog down the system, so 500 per day. Right. Okay. But as you just also pointed out, so each D DI device um, identifier record is one XML file, and then you can put multiple XML files when you submit. In a submission batch, yep. correct. Right, okay. and you can put, so it's one XML, one record, and each record is in that folder structure. You mm -hmm. can put five records in one folder structure. So one XML, one record, one folder structure for one record and one XML. So you can take five, 500 of those records in 500 distinct folder structure and drop them all at one time. Okay. If you use the um, ESG, B2B option, the large volume option. And that's the benefit of using that. Yes. Is there an example of what tool I would use to submit multiple devices at one time? I know batches are uploaded in other web interfaces via Excel spreadsheets. Oh. We don't yeah. we don't have so the only way to submit a good ID is via the XML option in the folder structure that Linda talks about in the presentation via the um, FDA electronic submissions gateway. Um, you cannot submit files as Excel spreadsheets. Um, there is no other format that can be submitted. The only other format is the manual data entry via the Good ID web application. Okay. So there's the two. Just the and two. And that's it. Yes. Okay. How long does it take to get an account and conduct our testing? Now, this could be a little bit of a tricky question because I know you're talking about ESG and then the other account. Right. So ESG, I, I think the slide sort of laid out all of, you know, how many weeks you should 
give for each. Again, it depends on the labeler and their level of technical competency and how much back and forth there is going on. And, um, you know, you could get your ESG account, do a successful test very quickly, get your good ID account, again, do a successful test very quickly and be off and running. Um, do your homework. Again, the time spent up front viewing these presentations and sitting down and thinking about your data and making <coughs> sure you have good quality data and good information is time well spent. It will save so much time on the back end, weeks and weeks yes. of time on the back end. And that kind of ties into our next question. If we have already have an electronic submission gateway production account, so they already have that mm -hmm. ESG account, how do we get a good ID account? So the electronic submissions gateway account, it's great. That means they've done, you know, they're a third of the way through for mm -hmm. the SPL process. They can reuse the electronic submissions gateway account. And I'll assume that if they have a production account with the electronic submissions gateway, they also have a electronic submissions gateway test account. So that part's done. Now they just need to send in a good ID account request via the help desk. They will get a good ID test account because they want to do SPL. No. And once they complete testing, and for testing, as Linda has in her slides, they would use their ESG test account to send good ID test submissions. And after they complete testing, then they would ask for a good ID production account. Okay. So, so it's kind of breaking it down into right. the different parts. Okay. How often does how often does a record need to be updated in Good ID? Does it need to be updated for every batch lot of production? So this is kind of going back to just the general question. Right. DI question. DI. So Good ID again a DI a device identifier identifies a version or a model of a device and a labeler of that device. So. Every time you um, you introduce a new version or a model, a record needs to be submitted to Good ID. And as far as each production um, lot or batch, there is no need to re-enter that information. If you remember, we only capture the device Based identifier, identifier. portion. Mm -hmm. We don't capture every lot or batch that's out there. All we ask you to tell us is um, which are what are the production identifiers that are on your label? Are you using lot numbers? Are you using serial numbers? And you just tell us yes or no. The only time you need to do any changes is when you need to update that record. For example, um, if you say I'm no longer going to sell a package of 20 that I was selling, um, you will come in and update your record and say I'm discontinuing this package. That would be an update. So you would need to make your updates, I believe, within 10 days um, of when you make a change on the label of the device and you start, again, distributing it. Um, the only other time you would need to put in new records would be if there is a brand new version or a model that you plan to introduce. Okay. So it goes back again to the DI is really what is yes. needing to be updated. Right. Okay. We have uh, enough time for about one more question. And we have a couple that have come in for ESG, but hopefully we can answer these kind of quickly. What do we do if we submit vi via HL7 SPL and the system is down for maintenance? All right, so um, if you um, saw the presentation, we ask that most, you know, we request that you sign up to be notified when the system is down. If we know um, um, in advance that we're planning to take the system down for any reason, we send a notification to all our users and let them know that the system will be down. So when we send you a notification, I guess we request that you please don't send submissions when the system is down. Um, for whatever reason you are not aware and you happen to send a submission and the system is down or the system went down unexpectedly and we were not aware of it, most of the time the SPL submissions will just stay in a queue. And once the system is back up, we will be able to process your submission and the system will go through the queued submissions and it will push them through one at a time. If for any reason, um, you know, your submission doesn't get processed or the acknowledgement messages don't come through, they would just contact us and then we'll be able to look into it and provide you assistance through the help desk. Okay. But the first step is to be aware of when the system is yes. down for maintenance and just don't submit at that just time. Just don't submit at the time, yes. Okay. And that's about all we have for today. So thank you all for your participation and for your thoughtful questions.
This concludes today's CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. We hope you found today's program valuable. We'd like to know your thoughts on today's program and look forward to your feedback. Please complete the survey at the link that appears on the screen now. This survey is also available on our website. Today's program, including the presentations and Q&A sessions, will be available on the CDRH Learn website in about a week, so you can access them as a resource anytime you like. For any further questions you may have, or ones we did not answer today, please send them to us at DICE. You can call us during our normal work hours or email us at DICE at FDA.HHS.gov. We look forward to hearing from you, and remember, we're always here to guide you through the CDRH regulatory process. We're just a phone call or email away. I'd like to thank our expert panels, our CDRH colleagues that field the questions behind the scenes, the FDA studio team, and you, our audience, for joining us for today's program. Thank you.